Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Good to be with all of you and on this special day. And I know I'm thinking about my mom. She has been with the Lord now almost three years, but lives on in me, powerfully affecting me every day. Um, her influence, her memories, her prayers, all that she did for me. She was tall, thin, red hair, athletic, uh, played violin for the Virginia Symphony. Uh, when she was 19, she met Christ in a way that changed her and immediately felt a sense of calling and wanted to go to Africa to save the continent of Africa. But then she met my dad and he was more challenging than Africa, so she decided to get married to him. And little did she know what her four children, or five, excuse me, her five children would be like because we came along and gave her uh, the challenge of, of, of her lifetime. Um, she loved Jesus and then she loved us for Jesus and saw so little encouragement or thanks, little result. <clears throat> she uh, got mostly just slam doors and sulky expressions in return for all that she did. She was the chief cook and bottle washer. She was the supply officer. She was the maid. She was the taxi driver. And we barely noticed. It wasn't until we were adults, and I know for me it wasn't until I was in the 10th grade that I started realizing there was a person that was crucial to my life, realizing its full potential, who was doing the laundry, who was driving me to my uh, extracurricular activities. And, and I began to thank her and began to show any spiritual interest. And by that time, most of her work was already done. So she definitely had the ability uh, to love for Jesus' sake and not for the results. And I thank her today. Um, as adults, we all rise up and call her blessed. I know my three sisters and my brother, we're all singing her praises today, even though she's already in, in heaven. She lives on in each one of us. Much of what I have experienced in my life or become or done that is good is because of thousands, literally thousands of prayers prayed for me with the heart of a mother's love. And that just makes me humble and grateful. And I just receive it from her. She lives on. And I'm so thankful with the strength, the, root, the deep roots that she was the constant presence when I was young, the loving, secure presence when I was young. And um, our society has glorified a very different type of woman. <clears throat> Her life, for better or worse, um, was not glamorous. It was completely a servant. She put her violin under the bed and laid down her life for each one of us, became the MVP of our family, gave up her life so we could all find ours. And today, this morning, because I know where I'm going in the message and what I've studied all week in the Sermon on the Mount, I'm thankful to her because she's helped me to be real and you need me to be real. You need to be able to know that, that I'm not a wolf in sheep's clothing as I lead you spiritually. And uh, it was because my mom was real. She was a real example of Jesus and Christianity and the gospel. And then she prayed that into me. It took a while. But once it got a hold of me, it's, it's, it's real for, for me. And so um, I'm, I'm thankful as we approach our subject today. So with that as an as a introduction... <clears throat> We get into the passage in the Sermon on the Mount, like so many other passages in the Sermon on the Mount, that have led to famous expressions. So to say someone's a wolf in sheep's clothing goes back to Jesus' teaching in the passage we're looking at this morning in Matthew chapter 7. We've been going along paragraph by paragraph, and this is where we happen to be uh, this morning, where Jesus talks about false prophets. People who speak for God, people who lead you spiritually, people you listen to who represent God to you. And that might be me as your main teacher that you regularly come to or wherever you go to church. It might be the main pastor teacher or someone else on staff. It might be a small group leader, an adult Bible fellowship teacher in, in our church. It might be a, an influential friend. It, it uh, might be a, a, an author that you read regularly who writes about spiritual things and you're giving them a huge trust. If you're letting them talk to you about God and Jesus and the gospel and the Bible, that is a huge risk that you're taking. They could be a false prophet. They could be a wolf 
in sheep's clothing. So even if it's, a, a, again, an influential friend, uh, someone you watch on video who's a national speaker, uh, our passage today will start out with a great warning. Watch out. And we begin reading in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, you will recognize them. All right, now in the, in the time we have to look at this passage, I'm going to make four points. The first is false prophets are real. Okay, they're real. Jesus is bringing the subject up because they're all over the place. And they're on the TV, and they're in the bookstore, and, and they might even be someone that you run into. We change churches on average in our country about every uh, five years, a third of us will change churches for travel or for uh, whatever reason. Our children leave us and go off to college, or they start working jobs in other cities, and they look for new churches, and we sign up under the, the leadership of, of spiritual uh, prophets, people who would represent present God to us all the time. And we need to know how to check them out. We need to know how to make sure that they're not a false prophet because false prophets are real. Did you notice the passage begins with the warning, skull and bones, flashing siren or siren whales and flashing lights. Jesus saying, danger, beware, watch out. This could happen to you. And you could really lose a lot if you trust the wrong spiritual leader. Um, uh, he had the admiration and praise of countless church leaders, politicians, even the president of the United States. A large percentage of his followers were from Christian homes and were well educated. And they believed they were experiencing a higher form of fellowship and of service. He was committed to those in need. He, he was committed to outreach. He was committed to social action. He counseled prisoners, juvenile delinquents. He started a job placement center. He opened rest homes for the elderly, homes for the retarded. He had a health clinic. He organized a vocational training center. He provided for free legal aid. He claimed to cast out demons. He claimed to do miracles, to be able to heal people. He preached about God regularly. He preached about community. His followers uh, looked to him for, for respect and for love, and they received it regularly. He was a very dynamic minister. He had a multiracial family. Uh, many saw him as even a civil rights leader. Um, but when they looked closer, when they look back, when many of us in the country look back, we see that he promoted himself, not Jesus. And we see that he used celebrities, the press, to do this. He mishandled the power and the money that was involved in his leadership. He was preoccupied with sex in its normal and deviant forms. He misused the time of his followers. He misused the time of the people that that he led, he repeatedly lied to gain advantages. And as we know, in the 1970s, he convinced a thousand of his followers to move with him to a remote jungle in Guyana. And they were gonna build a whole new world. And once they were down there, people began to get in the following, to get, to get disenchanted and try to return to the US and he actually hired gunmen to shoot them as they were trying to board planes killed many, including Representative Leo Ryan of California, who had gone down to Guyana to confirm growing rumors. He was shot. And soon after this, on November 18, 1978, he ordered his followers to drink a cyanide-laced punch 
and more than 900 people died, about 300 of which were children. And that makes this the single largest loss of American civilian life until 9-11, the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. He died himself with them from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And from the autopsies, they learned that a certain number of those who died in his falling were actually held and forcibly injected with the poison. And looking back, the greatest tragedy was not that 900 or more than 900 people died. It was that more than 900 people died believing that they were serving God. Of course, I'm talking about Jim Jones and the People's Temple. One of the dramatic examples of a wolf in sheep's clothing. They're real. False prophets like this aren't all so dramatic, but they're, they're real. They're real, and Jesus wants us to watch out for them. The immediate reference point for Jesus when he taught this was the Pharisees, as we know, the whole Sermon on the Mount was a challenge to them, was throwing down the gauntlet saying, you need new leaders. Stop following the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They're, they're leading you down the, the wrong path. They're, they're representing God in a, in, in, in a way that's, that's damaging you spiritually. So you got to get new leaders, and, and I'll be that leader for you. That's basically the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. They were the false prophets. They were the wolves in sheep's clothing. And so we are sheep and Jesus is telling us we're vulnerable. We're, we're easily led and easily deceived. And the person we choose to be our leader has tremendous power in our life. And we're completely vulnerable to them for the things they tell us, especially if they're talking to us about spiritual things, God, the Bible, Jesus, the way of salvation. We, we have to go very slowly, very carefully before we trust and listen to someone talk to us and lead us about God to be a prophet. They might be false. If they're false, we have so much to lose. So much to lose. False prophets are real. That's the first point. The second point, and it's still from the first verse in the passage, is from the analogy of the wolf in sheep's clothing. They're not just real. They're in disguise. There's no warning on their books. There's no badge they wear that says false teacher. They themselves think they're true prophets and they look very much like true prophets. You can't recognize them in a lineup. If you put them together, they can't recognize themselves. They're deceived and they're deceiving their followers. So they're in disguise. What's what makes it so challenging, so difficult is they have this sheep's clothing that makes us uh, at ease, even though inside they're a ravenous wolf and their manner isn't ravenous, but their teaching is. And so they come across in a way that impacts us in the moment and influences in the moment, and we've got to look past that disguise to see who they really are, where their teaching really leads us. But make no mistake, they're, they're charismatic, they're dynamic, they're eloquent, they're knowledgeable, and uh, even caring, reassuring, encouraging, compassionate, even demonstrating good works and care as with Jim Jones. So many acts of service, and you can say, well, my gosh, he's doing so much good, he's got to be a good man. No, that's not true. That was part of his sheep's clothing. He's really a wolf. You judge him by his teaching, not by his manner, not by his apparent giftedness or the impact in the moment. You got to look past that, look past the disguise and say, who is this guy or who is this woman, whichever, whoever's leading you, friend, mentor, preacher, teacher, I'm going to use he just to make it easier, refer to the person. They're not just real, false prophets are in disguise. I remember one example of this. Um, I know, like for me, I can, I can read a, a book by an author that's not Christian and I can enjoy the book. I can listen to a, a, a musical performance by a, an artist that's not Christian and it doesn't bother me. I enjoy the music. I can watch a movie that's portrayed by an actor whose life may be totally messed up. I don't care. I enjoy their acting. I enjoy the movie. I can listen to a lecture by, you know, uh, by a professor or a teacher on history or military strategy or business business and I can benefit from that no matter what that man or woman is like. But if any of these people start going on a bunny trail and they start talking to me about God, Jesus, the Bible, the way of salvation, spiritual things, my antenna goes up. 
And I don't want to be fooled to think that because of their area of expertise, that that means that what they're saying about God and these other things has credibility because that's sheep's clothing. Let me give you an example. I know my, uh, when I was a freshman in high school, the guy who was the student body president for our Christian school was a strong leader, fair haired boy for the school, everybody. He was a great example. He also was uh, one of the main counselors of the Christian camp I went to as a camper and would eventually become a, as a counselor. I kind of followed in this guy's shoes. And then he went, he graduated, he went to William & Mary College in, in Williamsburg, Virginia. Some of my siblings have graduated, there's a great school. But he went and he majored in philosophy. And he ran into a, a professor, just shipwrecked his faith, made him a total skeptic. And it was the last I heard, it was years of just total shipwreck, gave up all the values of his, of his uh, upbringing, his church, his school, his family, just threw it all over for some professor and what the professor told him sitting in a classroom. And I did a lot of youth ministry. You know, before I became a pastor, I was a youth pastor in uh, Dallas and in Houston. And we graduated a lot of kids and saw them go off to college. We had uh, one professor, a freshman philosophy professor at Southern Methodist University, SMU, who was infamous for on the first day, taking a Bible in his hands, walking across the front of the classroom to the window and throwing it out the window. And then he would come back to these students fresh out of their protective environments. And he would proceed to dismantle their faith in the Bible. And he was just so good at attacking it. And he could tell them, your parents, your pastor, they don't know anything. They're, they're naive. And, and, and he could disregard their whole example, their whole life, their influence, all their, you know, just with his little looking smart in a classroom. And, and it would work. It's amazing that it works. His classroom is his sheep's clothing. He looks so smart, knows so much. But if you look a little closer, dig a little deeper, spend a little more time, you see that he only knows a lot about a few things that he studied. And in the classroom, that looks good. You take that same professor, stick him in a hospital or in a cemetery, he doesn't have much to say that's relevant. You take that same professor and you ask him, do you know anything about that book you just threw out the window? And he wouldn't pass a freshman level at a Bible college or seminary of knowledge about the book that he threw out the window. And you can keep asking him, hey, you know, you're so good at, uh, at attacking our faith and the faith of, of our families and our church and our school. Tell me what you believe. I mean, let's get past your, your aura of knowledge and this classroom. I want to know your answer to how life began and what happens when we die. Therefore, what is the purpose of life? I'm listening. And what is the historical evidence, the reasonable evidence, and the historical basis for what you're saying that comes along behind it? Because I, I really like what I have till I hear you explain something better. You're pretty good at attacking me. But what do you believe? Oh, and you know, I don't even know you. Tell me about your family, your marriage, your kids, your personal life. Are you happy? Is your life blessed? This thing you're going to tell me now because you're shooting down my prophets, my spiritual leaders, then what do you have to offer me? If you're going to lead me in a different direction, is it working for you? You see, I wish that everybody could get past the sheep's clothing to the wolf, but they're in disguise and the disguise is often the expertise. And then it's a sleight of hand. They go from that area of expertise and now they're talking about something they don't even realize. God, Jesus, the Bible, the Holy Spirit. What is the purpose of life? But it's working, and Jesus is warning about it. Don't let anybody talk to you spiritually until you know them, until you trust them, because the disguise is there. But they're really a wolf, and they may not even know it. It's not necessarily how they come across, ravenous, but it's going to be what happens to you. Okay, so the disguise, they're real and they're in disguise. The third point, still from the first verse, from the image of the wolf in sheep's clothing, is false prophets are, are uh, they do great harm. You need to imagine a wolf with bloody jowls having just ripped a sheep apart. And we need to imagine the wolf, not from our perspective, but from the perspective of a sheep. Because in this metaphor, we are the sheep and the wolf is uh, the threat that's coming to us. So it's completely terrifying and predatory and, and ravaging, damaging us. 
This is the third point. False prophets who claim to represent God, speak for God, who claim to want to influence us, mentor us, lead us spiritually, uh, they can... They can ruin your abundant life on earth and even your eternal life in heaven. They can lead you. You see, this is the context for the sermon. And Jesus just talked about a road, a narrow road to heaven, to life, and a broad road to hell, a broad road to destruction. And these would be the guys patting you on the back all the way to hell. These are the blind guides that lead the blind and they fall in a pit that Jesus is talking about. And so they're impressive and they're saying all kinds of things and having a great impact or comforting or encouraging or whatever it is, but nothing in what they say ever causes you to turn around and go on the road to life. And so no matter what you can say about how great their teaching is and how wonderful they are, in the end, they just pad you on the back all the way to eternal destruction. And that's scary. I know I think of David Koresh, you know, that creepy guy with the beard and the long hair. He had that spell, the Branch Davidian sect. Remember that 51-day standoff with the FBI and the ATF that eventually led to an inferno that burned up most of the 75 followers? They died in the fire. Again, a third of them were children. And this guy, David Koresh, you know, I could go on about him. But he's a dramatic, again, and a dramatic example of hundreds of thousands, even millions of people following the charisma of a spiritual leader to their ultimate destruction. And Jesus is the one who just said there are two roads, one to life, one to destruction. And these would be the guides on the road to destruction. False prophets do great harm. They do great harm. And of course, there are many examples, many more examples we can give, not to pick on any particular ones, but TV preachers who've lived scandalous lives and misused money and power and sexuality, and that this has caused countless people to write off the Christian gospel to their own eternal destruction. Do you see that? That is another example. Somebody gifted with sheep's clothing, but in the end, the result of their character, their ministry, their exposure has caused many people to be turned off to the faith and ultimately destroyed. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And Jesus says... It's a serious thing for someone to be a prophet, for someone to say they speak for God, and for you to call someone your prophet. Make sure they're true, not false. And all that is the first verse. And then the five remaining verses in the passage, Jesus just, just gives this last point. Okay, and the last point is false prophets are discovered by their fruit. By their fruit. Jesus said, test them. Test a friend, a mentor. Even a parent, you can honor them, but don't let them lead you spiritually until you test them. Do they know? Do they even know what is right spiritually? Are they putting you on the right path? Uh, certainly a minister, a Bible teacher, a Christian author. Check them out. And you can do this. And Jesus tells us exactly how in the remaining five verses in this passage. I know when I bought a home, whenever we bought a home four or five times in our lifetime, Lynn and I, we hire a professional inspector, we hire a lawyer to help us sign piles of documents, because it's a huge trust, it's a lot of money. And I think, how much more risk is there for someone when you regularly let them lead you to your eternal destiny, to the assurance of your salvation, to know whether or not you're praying to Jesus, whether or not you're filled with the Holy Spirit, whether or not you're understanding the scripture correctly. It requires even more testing. There's even more at stake, even more need to do due diligence in inspecting them. And so for this, Jesus changes the metaphor. Okay, it's not a mixed metaphor. He's just using a second metaphor because the first metaphor helped us see the, the, the destructive nature and the disguise of the false prophet. But he goes, if you want to know if they are false or true, you got to change the metaphor. No more wolf in sheep's clothing. Now let's bring out trees and fruit. Okay, trees and fruit. He goes, you got to look from this angle. You can't really tell a wolf in sheep's clothing, but you can tell a tree by its fruit. Okay, so we, here we go. Um, the key word is fruit. Jesus uses it seven times, and I brought an example, so I thought it would be helpful to have a visual. Um, 
This is an apple, but is it a good apple or a bad apple? Well, we just have to see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Tart, sweet, juicy, crunchy, full flavor. It's a honey crisp apple. And if you don't know what that is, it's the most expensive apple at Kroger or wherever <laughs> you go. Meyer, Walmart, Giant Eagle, wherever you go, honey crisp is a good apple. And you can know it if you just take a bite. And I'm going to take, hold on. This is awesome. I should eat more when I preach. Seriously good. Okay. Jesus uses this metaphor in John 15 for the evidence of God in our life. So you should be able to look at me and look for this. We say, Dean, you talk so much about God every week. You seem to know so much about the Bible. Any of that working for you, Bubba? Huh? No, seriously, my gosh, how long have you been a Christian now? How long have you been a minister? You're always bragging about that. Oh, let's add it up. That many years, oh, wow. I'm looking for some result on that. Stop your words. Stop your influence, your impact in the moment. How's this showing up for you, making you different from everybody else in the world doesn't have what you have? How's that working in your marriage, your, your children, your family? How's it changed your life? And I don't, I don't want... I don't even need you to talk. I'm just going to find out from other people because I got to get away from your sheep's clothing and I'm checking out your fruit. I'm looking for the evidence of God in your character, your influence, the results of your ministry, not the initial impact, but the results. You say, oh, let me see, 31 years, is there, what's in your wake? I want to check that out a little bit because that's where I'm going to write. And Jesus said, you look from that angle and you'll see it. You'll see it. Because you see, it's, it's, a wolf can put on sheep's clothing, but you change to the second metaphor, it's really hard to fake a honey crisp apple. It's very hard to fake this. I can come across to you one way, but if I let you know who I am, you can just check, check out. And this is true for everyone who would lead you spiritually. Look for the result, look for the impact, not just of them and their character, but in their message, in their teaching. Where is that teaching leading them? And that may sound good in the moment, but hang around for a while again. Go a little deeper, come a little closer, stay a little longer, and see how is that working in a year or two? Or how is it with the people who have been there for two or three years? What's the atmosphere? Is, is there a sense of life and joy, or is this legalism and repression, and, and nobody wants to come in, and all that stuff? You have to look at the fruit. Got to get past the initial impact. We might call it the sheep's clothing. Get past the suit and look at the fruit. That helped me years ago. I think it's kind of corny, but still. Get past the appearance, the manner, and get down to the real essence, the result, the character in someone's life. And this is something that Jesus is saying. That's how we can discover it. That's how we can do that test. So how do you do that in a larger church? You can't all know me. You can't all come sit down with me, talk to me. But you can know someone who does know me. You can talk to Ken Mulpis, or we'll be introducing the elders in a moment. You could talk to any of them, or you could talk to any of the staff and say, Is, can you get past Dean's surface to any kind of What's he like? What, what, do you see any fruit? And Jesus didn't say the, the kind of fruit. He didn't say every spiritual leader has to have this particular fruit. No, he could be any, all different kinds. He doesn't say the amount. He has to be, have all this. No, it's just good or bad. It's just so easy. It's just to see, is there good fruit or is there bad fruit? Is there an evidence of God at work blessing this man, this woman, or, or not? Is he faking? Is she faking? Is this ultimately going to destroy me? You can tell by their character, by... The result in their ministry over time. And so you have to stay, look a little deeper, bite into the apple. And for many of us, um, so sometimes an author, if you can't get to know them, or a national speaker, you can't ever do this. Look in their ministry, in their speaking, are they current? Are they fresh? Are they in the moment? Are they putting their heart into the, the thing they're saying? Are, are, do you feel like you know them any better after they speak? Because some ministers are more vulnerable, open, sincere, authentic, and others are not. They're just kind of giving you the message with old stories and 
then you still don't know. And you, there's a red flag or at least a yellow flag. And you're like, hey, I can't do this test on you. I'm, I'm not sure. I can't do a fruit inspection if I can really trust you. And so any good leader, any good shepherd, any true prophet will welcome the challenge, will welcome the test. If you have questions to ask about doctrine, if you have questions to ask about the past, you know, we're wide open. And the reason is we respect those who need to do a fruit inspection before they trust a spiritual leader. And we're saying, Jesus is saying, do that. And you will protect your souls, uh, even potentially from eternal uh, destruction. It's not just the man, it's the message too. So if they're teaching you really from the Bible, you have to ask, are you leaving anything out? Is there any like serious omissions or distortions or imbalance in your theology and your teaching? Um, or, do, or do you just kind of start with the Bible and then jump off and then just say a bunch of your own ideas? And I'm not, I'm not really learning this book or are you teaching this book? These are some of the questions that you can ask that all go under the category of the fruit inspection. Check out the man. Check out the message. Check out his teaching and see if it's really coming to, coming to you from the Bible. And then see how it's working in their life. Before you make that decision to join that new church, to send your child to a church when they go to college, or to decide to take a mentor or read a book, uh, watch a video. If you let anybody lead you spiritually, um, check the fruit and see... If it's good, if they flunk the test, get out before you get had. <laughs> and if they pass the test, honor them, encourage them, support them and do what they would want. I know more than anything else, just be a doer of the word and follow the way, follow the way of life. Well, we're going to go back now to worship and communion and honoring our mother. So would you bow with me and let's pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for this time in our worship service where we learn, where we hear the teaching of Jesus. Thank you for him, how he speaks truth and leads us on the path of life. Help us, Lord, to, to trust and believe and follow true prophets, not false prophets. Deliver us uh, bless our leadership, lead them as they lead us. I thank you for the accountability of our elders and how they hear Christ and lead our church um, and how much that saves us, uh, even in this subject. Bless us now as we sing and remember Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>